Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome all of you to join tonight's uh, webinar, which is the joint uh, IAN and the ISPD webinar. The title of today's webinar is Precision Dialysis to Improve Long-Term PD Outcomes. As you all are aware, um, in 2020, the ISPD has published this document about prescribing high-quality goal-directed peritoneal dialysis. And in fact, one of the key aspects in PD prescription relates to vol volume management and also ultrafiltration. And today, we are very um, honored um, to have two distinguished speakers uh, from Europe. We have Johan Morel from Belgium and also Mark Lambie from the United Kingdom to provide us insights into this topic about precision dialysis. And my name is Angela Yi Moon Wang, and I'm from Hong Kong. It's also a great honor to moderate this webinar um, on behalf of the two societies. So in fact, this current webinar aims to explore individualizing peritoneal dialysis for better patient outcomes. And during this webinar, we will cover peritoneum's role as the dialysis membrane, assessing its function and factors leading to this function, and also participants will learn to tailor PD prescription based on the peritoneal and genetic characteristic. In addition, the session will also address predictors of PD longevity, transition to hemodialysis, and reducing unwarranted practices variation to improve care for PD patients. So our learning objectives of this webinar is to understand peritoneum as a dialysis membrane, and also, as I've alluded to earlier, and also determine PD duration determinants, identify drivers of transition to hemodialysis. So with this, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today's session, Johan Morel from Belgium. So Johan Morel is a clinical nephrologist and professor of nephrology at the UC Louvain in Brussels, Belgium. Using a translational approach, his work focused on the mechanisms of osmosis and role of water channels in peritoneal dialysis and the link between fibrosis or inflammation and the loss of ultrafiltration, as well as studying the genetic determinants of peritoneal membrane function. Johan Morel currently serves also as, a mem as an executive committee member, ex executive council member of the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis and he contributed to the ISPD recommendations for the evaluation of peritoneal membrane dysfunction. So with this, I would like to um, invite Johan Morel to give his uh, talk um, on membrane function dysfunction in PD from mechanisms to clinical practice. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Angela, for the kind introduction. Thank you uh, to the ISPD and the ISN for the, the organization of this webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. So I'm Johan Borel from Brussels, and it's a great pleasure for me to, to be part of this webinar and to talk to you about membrane function and dysfunction in um, uh, PD from mechanism to clinical practice. So here are my disclosures. Uh, let's start with the first uh, case uh, presentation. This is the case of a 72-year-old woman with kidney failure due to type 2 diabetes. This uh, patient has been on CAPD for the last four years using 1.5% uh, glucose-based solutions four times a day. And the patient did well on PD. She uh, underwent a unique episode of staph epidermidis uh, peritonitis during the second year of therapy. And today, she comes to the dialysis unit uh, because of progressive shortness of breath and weight gain over the last two months. Her urine volume is stable at around 600 ml a day, and she's on furosemide. And on clinical examination, she gained four kilograms over the last few weeks. Her blood pressure is high. She has bilateral lung crackles, bilateral lower limb edema. And you can see here the results of our uh, peritoneal equilibration test performed over time on PD. Um, these PET were performed using hypertonic glucose, and you can see a progressive decline in net ultrafiltration capacity over time on PD, a progressive increase in D over P creatine ratio at the end of the test, and a progressive decline and then stabilization of the dip sodium. So the first question for this case 
and you will be able to, to vote and to participate, what is the cause of fluid overload and the underlying mechanism? Is it catheter dysfunction due to catheter migration, acute PD-related peritonitis, excessive fluid and salt intake, or membrane dysfunction due to an acquired fast transport status? And the second question, you can answer this uh, simultaneously, how would you manage this patient? Would you recommend, and here we have two uh, right answers. Uh, so would you recommend dietary counseling and increased loop diuretic dose? Would you consider automated PD and the use of icodextrin? Would you prescribe corticosteroids? Or would you transfer the patient to hemodialysis via a central venous catheter? And you can vote right now. So here are the results, and uh, most of you um, choose uh, that the patient has membrane dysfunction or diagnosed membrane dysfunction with an acquired fast transport status, uh, which is a very good answer, and uh, would recommend that counseling and increase the loop diuretics dose, which is, of course, very important and relevant in this patient, and also uh, potentially consider automated PD in the use of icodextrin in this patient. So the next uh, case presentation. So a 31-year-old woman with kidney failure due to lupus nephritis. This patient was recently started on CAPD uh, using glucose-based PD solutions, 1.5%, then rapidly 2.5% uh, glucose-based solutions. Her urine volume is approximately uh, 600 ml a day as well. And after four weeks on PD, she still has uh, fluid overload and relatively poor daily net ultrafiltration. There is no evidence of catheter dysfunction, no evidence of mechanical problem, and she seemed to have a good response in terms of uh, ultrafiltration to icodextrin. And at, at six weeks, a uh, patent equilibration test of four hours using hypertonic glucose as was performed and showed a net ultrafiltration of uh, 250 ml at the end of four, a DOP creatine ratio of 0.65, and a deep sodium at one hour of three millimole per liter. So the questions for this patient, what is the cause of fluid overload? Again, and the underlying mechanism, is it catheter dysfunction due to catheter migration, excessive fluid and salt intake, membrane dysfunction with a fast transport status or low intrinsic ultrafiltration? And the second question, how would you manage this patient? Would you recommend dietary counseling and increase loop diuretics, consider automated PD, use icodextrin, or uh, transfer the patient to hemodialysis via central venous catheter? And for the second question, again, you have two uh, right answers. So low intrinsic ultrafiltration, so with a membrane that is poorly permeable to water from the start of PD, and um, most of you uh, answered that uh, recommending dietary counseling and increased loop diuretic dose would be a good option and use icodextrin. We'll discuss this later during the uh, presentation. So, paternal dialysis is uh, effective and, and safe and represents the main home based dialysis modality worldwide. Very importantly, it promotes patient impairment, it's important for patients with chronic diseases, and it is now clear, as Angela mentioned earlier, that the main targets of high PD quality um, are not the numbers such as KD over V per se, but rather uh, patient well being, adequate nutritional status, and very importantly, as we'll discuss, optimal fluid balance. Fluid balance is a critical issue in PD as more than 50% of the patient on PD remain overhydrated and as the presence of overhydration is associated with a high risk for death and other complications independently from comorbidities. Etiologies of fluid overload in PD include excessive dietary sodium and water intake, loss of residual kidney function, and insufficient peritoneal ultrafiltration. Insufficient ultrafiltration may result from catheter issues, mechanical problems, or as we'll discuss in the next few minutes from membrane dysfunction or from a PD prescription that doesn't match uh, membrane characteristics or the patient's need. 
Therefore, optimizing uh, ultrafiltration is really key to restore fluid balance and to the efficiency of PD, and this relies on a functional peritoneal membrane and on a personalized PD prescription. So the learning objectives of this lecture are to understand the mechanisms of osmosis across the peritoneal membrane and the role of water channels in PD, to identify membrane dysfunction and its underlying mechanism, and lastly, to explain the impact of genetic variation on membrane function. To drive ultrafiltration, as you know, PD applies the principle of osmosis and the installation of a PD solution containing glucose or other osmotic agents into the peritoneal cavity generates a movement of water across specific pores of the peritoneal membrane. At the level of the microvascular endothelium, three types of pores of different sizes were predicted to explain the transparent movement of solutes and water during PD. Among these uh, three pores, abundant small pores allow the diffusion of small solutes like creatinine, as well as the transport of water coupled to sodium and the absorption of glucose. The ultra small pore was predicted to be located at the level of endothelial cells and to mediate the transport of water without solutes, also termed free water transport. It is now well established that um, the ultra small pores are actually water specific channels called the aquaporins. The aquaporins were discovered by Nobel Prize laureate uh, Peter Agrey and his team who demonstrated that these small proteins facilitate the diffusion of water molecules across biological membranes. These aquaporins were initially found to be expressed on the surface of red blood cells and in kidney tubules, and later found to be also expressed in the human peritoneal membrane, and more precisely in endothelial cells lining peritoneal capillaries, as illustrated on this slide. The development of a mouse model of PD and its application to transgenic mice lacking water channels demonstrated the major role of aquaparins in peritoneal ultrafiltration. In normal wild type mice, in red, the installation of hypertonic glucose into the peritoneal cavity drives ultrafiltration, increases intraperitoneal volume, and results in a sieving of the dilated sodium, which is the drop in dilated sodium concentration during the first part of the trial, resulting from free water transport. The deletion of the aquaporin 1 gene in mice in green results in a 40 to 50 percent decrease in net ultrafiltration and in the abolition of the sodium sieving, as shown here, demonstrating that the aquaporins are the molecular counterparts of the ultra small pores. So back to the patient now, based on this brief reminder of peritoneal physiology, we need as clinicians three types of information to assess the individual characteristics of the peritoneal membrane. We want to know about the diffusion rate of small solutes. How fast do small solutes cross the peritoneal membrane? We'd like to quantify the net ultrafiltration, the total amount of water removed during PD. And lastly, we'd like to have an estimation of the free water transport across the aquaporins and across the peritoneal membrane. To achieve these goals, the peritoneal equilibration test or PET was developed some years ago. And the PET consists in a standardized forward well using a glucose-based solution, and it allows the uh, quantification of the diffusion rate of small solutes, which is estimated from the dilated of the plasma creatine ratio at the end of the test. The use of hypertonic glucose for the PET also allows an accurate evaluation of net ultrafiltration and the quantification of the sodium sieving. Assessing membrane function is important and interesting because there is a huge variability in membrane characteristics between individuals already at PD start. And this variability, as we will discuss today, is associated with outcomes and has a clinical impact on fluid removal and dialysis prescription. In the recent update of the ISPD guidelines available in open access in Peritoneal Dialysis International, we discussed how to perform the procedure for the PET and how to evaluate membrane function and dysfunction in PD patients. Membrane dysfunction is defined as a membrane that fails to achieve sufficient ultrafiltration to maintain adequate fluid status and or as a low ultrafiltration uh, capacity during the peritoneal equilibration test in the absence of catheter or other mechanical problems. 
Based on the pathophysiology and clinical observation, three categories of membrane dysfunction can be identified. First, fast pectinal solute transfer rate, fast PSTR, causing a rapid diffusion of small solutes and fast absorption of glucose with ensuing low ultrafiltration capacity. Second, acquired membrane insufficiency when the membrane becomes less effective over time on PD as our first patient. And lastly, poor intrinsic ultrafiltration at the third at the second patient, meaning that the membrane is poorly permeable to water from the start of PD. Fast peritoneal solute transfer rate, fast PSTR is defined as a high DOP creatine ratio at the end of the test. These patients show a fast diffusion of small solutes and also rapid absorption of glucose across the peritoneal membrane, causing an early dissipation of the osmotic gradient, a low ultra low ultrafiltration capacity uh, with crystal with osmotic agents such as glucose, and these patients are at risk for poor ultrafiltration and fluid overload. Variability in solute transfer rate is partly explained by uh, some demographic and clinical characteristics, but its most important determinants are intraperitoneal inflammation with elevated dilated IL-6 levels, as shown by Mark Lamby and Simon Davies some years ago, as well as genetic variation. The influence of genetic variation on perineal solute transfer rate was recently confirmed in the BioPD study led by Raj Merotra. The BioPD study was the first genome-wide association study in PD patients, and it looked for potential associations between gene variants along the entire genome and baseline GVP creatine ratio at four hour. This important study included almost 3,000 patients from 69 centers in six countries. And the BioPD study showed that genetic variation explains approximately 20% of the variability in PSTR at baseline. And this is much more than the 10% for all clinical and demographic factors considered collectively. The BioPD study also identified several loci with suggestive associations with PSTR, as illustrated on this Manhattan plot, identifying some genes with a potential impact or role uh, on solute transfer rate across the peritoneal membrane. Identifying patients with fast PSTR is important as it has been associated with, in many studies with outcome uh, and as shown in this uh, relatively contemporary cohort of patients, including more than 10,000 patients in the US, fast PSTR at the start of PD is associated with all cause mortality, technique failure, and hospitalization. And the higher the DOP creatine ratio, the higher the risk for these hard outcomes. The increased risk in fast PSTR is at least partly due to low ultrafiltration capacity with glucose. Glucose indeed is a very small molecule rapidly absorbed across the peritoneal membrane with a transient effect on ultrafiltration, especially in individuals with fast PSTR. In contrast, icodextrin is a mixture of glucose polymers with some large colloidal fractions, generating a slower but more sustained ultrafiltration. And in systematic reviews, icodextrin was shown to increase daily net ultrafiltration and to mitigate episodes of uncontrolled fluid overload without compromising residual kidney function. Based on the underlying mechanisms, it is advised to shorten the duration of glucose-based dwells and to consider the use of icodextrin to prevent fluid absorption and maintain fluid balance in patients with fast PSTR. Membrane testing, therefore, offers an opportunity for intervention and adaptation of PD prescription has been associated with better survival in retrospective observational cohorts, as illustrated notably by these data from Simon Davies in the Stoke cohort. The second type of membrane dysfunction, we'll cover it very briefly, is acquired membrane insufficiency. The peritoneal membrane is a living tissue which undergoes uh, structural and functional alterations over time on PD, including progressive fibrosis, vascular proliferation, faster solute transfer rate, and loss of ultrafiltration capacity. Repeat longitudinal evaluation of membrane transport in a single patient may potentially be useful to monitor membrane integrity and detect membrane damage early. And lastly, low intrinsic ultrafiltration reflects a membrane as we already mentioned, that is poorly permeable to water uh, with a low ultrafiltration capacity and a low sodium sieving already at the start of PD and 
this is independent from solute transfer rate. Low intrinsic ultra filtration means that more glucose may be, may be required to achieve a similar ultra filtration and it may have a potential impact on outcomes. However, the mechanisms to explain this poor per peritoneal permeability to water remain largely unknown. And because this gap in our knowledge and because of the importance of water channels in water transport during PD, we asked the question some years ago, could there be a role for genetic variation in AQP1, the gene encoding water channels, to explain this variability or part of this variability between individuals? Genetic variation means that although we share more than 99% of DNA-based pa base pairs, there are, there are subtle changes in the DNA code along the genome, such as single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And when such variation occurs in the gene encoding or regulating a protein of interest, it may affect the normal physiological function of this protein. So to answer that question, uh, we collected uh, clinical and uh, information and in DNA from uh, almost 2018 in PD patients from uh, five countries. And we identified in a series of experiments and uh, analysis a specific aquaporin 1 gene variant, the RS207574, to be associated with water transport and outcome in PD. This variant is common, and 14% of the patients in the cohort have two copies of the variant, and we will refer to those patients as having a TT genotype. As, compare, as compared to patients who do not have any copy of the variant, those with the CC genotype in gray on this slide, the patients with the TT genotype in red have a lower ultrafiltration, both at the baseline PET and as shown here um, when considering daily net ultrafiltration, and they also have a high risk for death or transfer to hemodialysis as shown on the right, and this is independent from patent solution for rate. We also investigated the mechanisms by which the variant influences water transport and outcome, and we showed first that the risk variant is located in the uh, promoter of the aquaporin 1 gene, as shown here. This variant regulates the transcription of the gene, meaning that the presence of the variant is associated with less transcription of the gene, less production of uh, water channels, and we observed or provided evidence that patients with the TT genotype in red have less aquaporin-1 water channels in their patent microvasculature as compared to the patients with the CC genotype in gray, again on this slide. So the last question we asked was whether it is possible to mitigate poor outcomes associated with the aquaporin-1 risk variant. In contrast to glucose, which relies on the presence of aquaporins to drive ultrafiltration, uh, icodextrin induces ultrafiltration independently from motor channels, and preliminary results suggested that the aquaporin-1 risk variant does not affect ultrafiltration generated using icodextrin both in experimental models and in patients. So how, should, how, how could this information impact our clinical practice? Should, for instance, pre-diabetes patients be screened for the variant and those carrying two risk variants with a TT genotype be advised not to doing PD, but to start hemodiasis? I don't think so, no. And I would, I would, I would uh, recommend against such, such, a, such a conclusion. Indeed, PD offers many advantages, as we, as we mentioned, and as for many complex traits, the relative contribution of genotype to ultrafiltration is low. It explains only a few percent, and there is a significant overlap, as we have seen, in net ultrafiltration between the genotypes. And on top of that, when urine volume remains significant and no or moderate peritoneal ultrafiltration is required to achieve fluid balance, the impact of the variant is likely limited. Now, should PD patients be screened for the aquaporin-1 variant? In this population, screening might be useful for risk stratification and potentially mitigation, especially if fluid intake is excessive or if, fluid, if urine volume is low. And in patients carrying two risk variants, for instance, the use of icodextrin 
careful monitoring of fluid status and diuretic use may potentially help improving fluid balance and outcome, but this remain to be, um, remains to be confirmed in prospective uh, studies. And another um, but indirect message uh, suggested by the study is that fluid balance actually is important in all PD patients. So in, in summary, restoring and maintaining fluid balance is critical for the success of PD. Understanding how the peritoneum works as a dialysis membrane is key to individualize prescription and to improve clinical outcome. Identifying membrane dysfunction and the underlying mechanism may help tailoring PD prescription and management. And um, aquaporin one gene variant uh, influences water transport and outcome. Uh, in PD, and as a result, membrane testing and possibly genetic screening in the near future may be considered as ways towards precision medicine in diagnosis, meaning that we take the variability into account to individualize prescription and management, and ultimately to improve patients' outcome. I thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you. Thank you, Johan, for the excellent uh, and insightful lecture. Um, and before we open to the discussion, perhaps may I invite um, our second speaker of this session first to give his talk, uh, Professor Mark Lemby. Would you like to show your slides first so I introduce you? Um, so uh, Dr. Lemby was is currently a consultant nephrologist and reader in renal medicine at Peel University. He is the training program director for the Specialized Foundation Program in the West Midlands. He co-chairs the Midlands Kidney Network, Crook Dialysis Research and Innovation Network, and the UKKA Home Dialysis Special Interest Groups. He also teaches on national and international courses in PD, his research spans health services, translational and epidemiological approaches to dialysis. He's also the co-investigator for Intercept and National uh, Co-I for the PDOPS. So he's going to give us a talk about minimizing transfer to hemodialysis, optimizing time on PD. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to talk. So um, after that introduction, I'm just going to crack on with the um, so th there's disclosures. Um, so I'm just going to start off with a quick question. Um, how should we best increase the duration of time on PD? So would that be better treatment of peritonitis, better fluid management, more social support, lower peritonitis rates, less catheter problems, better leak management or increased clearance? Which of those do, do people think? should be the top priority. Now, I didn't get the slides in in time for that to be a formal um, questionnaire included in the way you handed, but um, have a, start having a think about that. And I'll just crack on with the, the rest of the talk. So I would argue that if you want to think about optimizing the duration of time on PD, that we have to start considering people getting onto PD in the first place. So if they don't get access to PD, their time on PD is zero. And I would say that's about the worst possible thing in terms of optimizing time on PD for their time to be zero. Everybody that sh would benefit or would choose to have peritoneal dialysis would in an ideal world be able to have it and would be able to access it and have the support necessary. Now, the next question then is, is that what's happening in practice? And the best answer to that, the best data on that is actually in the USRDS report, which just takes the estimated prevalence of different modalities. And you can see here that the blue bars show the proportion of the RRT population with the transplant. The red bars are in center HD, the green bars, the peritoneal dialysis, and you can see a few countries have got small bars for home hemodialysis. So the first thing I would say is that there's huge variability in the transplant prevalence from basically 0% up to 70%. And that has a dominant impact on the number of patients who are on in center hemodialysis. Clearly the red bars are much, much shorter than for patient countries with a high transplant rate than the um, where transplantation is uh, barely pre present. Now, in terms of the home dialysis, what you really want to do is be optimizing the patients that don't have a transplant, because obviously transplantation would be the optimal modality if it's possible. 
So we really want to be thinking about home dialysis as a prevalence, as a percentage of the total dialysis population. But the, that means that the size of the in-centre population will be in the denominator. So that will have a big impact on the prevalence. So the, there's the point that transplantation will have an impact on that ratio. But the other point to make in th from this data is that there clearly are big variations between countries in the number of patients on PD. So if you look in the middle, you can see Hong Kong, which actually has a remarkably high proportion of patients on PD, and that's really due to a national policy. Um, you can see the US, which is shortly just below that, and they've always had policies that have basically financially disincentivized home dialysis, and they've therefore always had a fairly low prevalence, although that has changed recently and it is increasing each year at the moment due to the change in the policy at, at a national level. So those are good examples of why there's variability between countries in that it really comes down to national policy and healthcare expenditure. And that's not really something that's open to change within the unit or by clinicians. But what about differences within a country? Well, there clearly is substantial variability within countries. So these are the two best data sources, as I'm aware of, to demonstrate this, and that's the UK and Australia and New Zealand. And they both show this same pattern. So if you look at its proportion of your dialysis population, then in the UK, we've got some centres that are 30 or even 35% of their total dialysis population. And in other units, it's down below 5%. So there's clearly different things happening within the same healthcare system. And that's not down to healthcare policy. And that means it's not really a patient choice. This is reflecting what units themselves are doing. But the prevalence will reflect both the number of patients getting on to peritoneal dialysis and the number of patients coming off peritoneal dialysis. So we also have to think about what happens to PD patients. And that's best demonstrated in the PDOPS data. So this is just demonstrating across the countries in PDOPS what the outcome for PD patients is. And you can see if you look at the bottom right for the US, then there's a fair few get transferred to hemodialysis, a few less are dying, and a few less than that are getting a transplant. And if you compare that to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and then the UK, you can see that the, trans the main difference between those countries, the transplant wedge, the light grey at the top, gets progressively bigger. And that translates into a different length of time typically spent on PD between those countries. So in the UK, the transplant rate really seems to be quite high, and that's driven the median time in PD there down to 1.7 years. The US, which has got much lower than those other three countries, or four countries, has a longer time on PD of 2.3 years. And then you can see Thailand and Japan, which have next to no transplantation relatively, they've got longer again times on PD of 2.9 and 3.5 years. So mostly through this huge variability in transplantation, you can see that there's a huge variability in the average length of time on PD that varies between countries. So transplantation is clearly having quite a major impact on the duration of time and therefore prevalence of PD in the countries. Just in case that doesn't that convince you um, just visually, then you can also do it by adjusted hazard ratios. And you can see that that's showing the same pattern. UK patients are four times more likely to get a transplant than patients in the US, who themselves are then about five times more likely to get a transplant than patients in Thailand or Japan. If you look at death, there is some variability between countries. Um, but less so than for transplantation. And actually, there's not a huge amount of variability in rates of transfer to hemodialysis between countries, although there is a bit. So what I've really shown you there is that there is substantial variability both in patients getting on to peritoneal dialysis, but also in the rates at which they come off peritoneal dialysis. And... Um, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the sources of that variation. And that's the best study that I'm aware of is the Intercept study, which is a study that we've been running in the UK. And that's to look at this unwarranted variation in patients getting on to PD in the first place and looking at that impact of between centre variation specifically. So not looking at healthcare policy at a national level, but looking at a unit level and the differences between units and what they do. And that's quite a difficult question to answer because nobody really knows why healthcare always has this unwarranted variation. But anyway, we've used an approach where 
we've taken multiple methodologies. So there's an ethnographic study where a not a healthcare professional, but an unbiased researcher goes into different units and just witnesses what happens in those units that's relevant to home dialysis. So they're, they're witnessing the nurses working, they're interviewing them, they see the patients and the healthcareers, they see the physicians and they interview them. So they get a really detailed picture of how that unit works in relation to home dialysis. There's then a survey of the English dialysis units, and then that's also the linked to registry data so that we can start to estimate what impacts the patient chances of getting onto home dialysis and that the other bits don't matter so much. So what do we what did we find? Well, the first thing to say is that in the four centres that had the ethnographic study, and these were all medium high to high rates of home dialysis, so all quite successful units, and those four units all had different completely different ways of organizing their services. So that very strongly suggests there is no ideal model. You can't just say everybody needs to do a particular adapt to a particular model. But what those sites did all share were aspects of their culture, attitudes, behaviour and leadership that all led to good uptake of home therapies. We also did the survey and we surveyed pretty much anything that we thought or may have some impact on home dialysis uptake. And of everything that we asked, pretty much everything showed variability. So there were very few things that all centres did uniformly. And th these graphs just demonstrate that. So it's just to demonstrate as a sample of all the things that we varied, that we um, measured, they all varied. Of the things shown here, which are to do with the education pathway and um, uh, information sources for the education pathway, and then a bit about kidney interactions for the unit with clinical props and clinical kidney charities and so on. None of those things appear to make any difference to the uptake of home dialysis in those units. But we did find some things and there was a consistent theme coming through in what did seem to make have an association with uptake of home dialysis. So the strongest and most striking finding that we got were that where the staff perceived that the unit had a culture that valued trying new initiatives, the more strongly the staff agreed with that, the higher the rates of home dialysis uptake in that unit. And you can see the, the plot above that. And that's really quite a remarkably strong correlation, bearing in mind that we're just doing a survey and getting a few staff perceptions of how things work in their unit. Another striking finding was that where staff perceived that the clinical lead thought home dialysis was important, that also appeared to have a reasonable level of correlation with home dialysis uptake. Now you can see from the plot above that just having your clinical lead being strongly enthusiastic about home dialysis is not in itself enough, but there are no units with a high uptake where the, the, the clinical lead thought it was unimportant. So leadership probably does matter, but in itself, the views of the leader doesn't in itself make the difference. Um, and we also had a strong correlation where staff were perceived as having opportunity to contribute to research, which is not immediately tied in, but I also wanted to show you this. So most of those positive correlations are really something to do more with the culture of the unit. And one of the things that we tested was whether those things were common. So you can see the correlations between these different practices. So staff having opportunities to reflect on practice, staff being encouraged to try new initiatives, staff having opportunities to contribute to research, and the centre being perceived as be having a commitment to ongoing and continuous improvement, they were all very strongly correlated with each other. So that very much suggests that generally there are going to be units with a good culture that will support home dialysis, and there'll be units with a less good culture that is less supportive of home dialysis. But these the culture is not specific to home dialysis. There are other aspects of culture that are clearly not related. So the views of the clinical lead about how important home dialysis is, that's a separate issue. Um, we then tried to estimate the impact of these associations. And um, that's quite a complicated thing to do. You can't just bung them in a straightforward, normal multivariable regression model. So you have to do a sort of causal framework for it. We, this is the causal framework we used, but really these are the more important bits, which is to say, what are the results? 
So there's some patient level things at the bottom, so ethnicity, deprivation, and so on, that we know has an impact on access to home dialysis. But there were some specific things at the top that also came out as important. So the centres that had had a quality improvement initiative within the last five years, you had an odds ratio of 1.76. Um, having had a roadshow, which is where patients have the opportunity to see other patients actually doing home dialysis had a positive impact. Having assisted PD had a positive impact. So there were some specific things as well as that cultural message that was coming through very strongly throughout the whole study. So I've shown you the variation in access to home dialysis, but we're also thinking about the outcomes and the same phenomenon is witnessed there. So this is ANS data demonstrating that same unwarranted variation in transfers to hemodialysis. And um, there's also UK data showing that exact same phenomenon. This varies between units. And the transfer to hemodialysis is not a good thing. We know it's associated with a higher risk of mortality. So this is across all, all registries. So this is just demonstrating that er early after your switch to hemodialysis, you're at a significantly higher risk of dying and that that risk dies the longer it's out, out from the switch you are, such that by about four to six months, the risk is down to a pretty steady baseline on the whole. We also know that there are risk factors for this, and those risk factors are the same across all the different registries, but there's a definite phenomenon that those risk factors have a really high impact at the start, and that that impact diminishes with time. So increased age as a risk factor for mortality, but particularly after the switch, same for longer duration of PD, the same from when the, the cohort was, so whether it was a long ago cohort or whether it's more contemporary cohort when the impact, the, the risk is not quite so much. And then a slightly odd impact of gender with females having higher risk early and males having higher risk later. Another reason why transitions are bad is that the patient experience is not great. And this is a result from a, quantitate, a qualitative analysis and some themes came through in the patient experience of these transitions. So there was a theme of resistance to change and a fear of hemodialysis. The um, experiencing the transition of the transition being shared with the family and a sense of adjustment and sense of self. Um, it was important to point out that patients initially anticipated losses with transitions to hemodialysis, but in retrospect, they also recognized that there were gains, not in all patients, but some patients definitely reported having some improvements through switching to hemodialysis. So it's not a straightforward, bad or good thing at all times. Um, just to show you some of the risk factors for these tr transfers to hemodialysis, there are patient level risk factors. So we know that patients with lower albumins, worse residual renal function, male gender, comorbidity, and um, uh, obesity, are all risk factors for having transitioned to hemodialysis. In terms of the facility practices, um, probably the, the, the most striking finding I think that we've got is that having a routine multidisciplinary review of patients was also probably associated with a reduction in risk of transition to hemodialysis, but there's, it's um, un slightly uncertain because the confidence intervals are just about crossing one for that one. But in terms of trying to address that transfer to hemodialysis, what can you do? Well, one of the problems with transfer to hemodialysis is that there's many, many different causes of it. So you have to start being a bit more specific and saying which cause is causing the problem. And this is, again, the best data on that's coming from PDOPS. And this shows you by category the most common causes of transfers. So you can see that on the left hand side, we've got peritonite. Well, infection at the bottom is the commonest cause of transfer to hemodialysis. And above that, solute clearance, water problems or ultrafiltration problems, psychosocial or medical issues, and then a variety of other ones, progressively less so. Um, there are differences between the countries, or apparent differences between the countries anyway, in that. Um, Thailand and the UK appearing to have a particular issue with infection. Um, Japan in particular, and this will fit with you, what Johan's just been talking about, they have patients being on PD for much longer relatively low it's a peritonitis so they do run into that membrane problem the ultrafiltration problems which is why their um, blue bar there is quite so large it's also worth pointing out that there's often more than one reason 
Um, and if we look at the secondary reasons, then we're still getting roughly the same messages coming through. Infection's a big issue. Ultrafiltration, particularly in Japan, um, maybe slightly more of the psychosocial and medical wear, possibly. Um, the, when these problems occur, it varies with the duration of PD. So for patients in the early stages of PD, unsurprisingly, catheter problems and leaks are particularly common. Um, but they then diminish with time and aren't really much of a problem later on, whereas the ultrafiltration problems, the psychosocial and medical problems become much more obvious later on. Now, if we were wanting to try and minimise transfers to hemodialysis, we then need to focus on the most common problems then. So the first question is, is if you have a problem with transfers to hemodialysis at your unit, well, you need to think about peritonitis. And again, we have this same problem of unwarranted variation in peritonitis rates. So there's differences internationally between countries, but there's also this issue of substantial variability within countries. So on the left, you've got the between country data. On the right, you've got the unit level data demonstrating that phenomenon of the variation between units. Now, Peritonitis is another problem where it's not clear exactly what it is that centres need to do to minimise it. But we do have the example set in Australia, whereby they decided their rates, which were used to be 0 0.6, were too high. They had a national drive to try and improve that. And you can see the impact of that fairly clearly towards the left hand side of that graph as the peritonitis rate suddenly plummet which is probably partly an impact of just straightforward benchmarking, making sure patients, people know what their rates are and can compare them, but also things like um, trying to ensure that people are following the best evidence-based practice in terms of peritonitis prevention. Um, and that's really basically going to the SPD guidelines on infection, uh, which are the gold standard in how to approach that. Um, also, just worth pointing out that there is some data that's come through from PDOPS on that. It has actually been factored into the latest version of the guidelines, uh, but there are some slightly um, so some things that weren't obvious before. So higher automated PD use of, does appear to be associated with a slightly lower rate of peritonitis. Using antibiotics at the time of catheter insertion is, was known. Um, Facilities with a PD training duration of six or more days versus less. So those units had a slightly lower rate of peritonitis. Um, that wasn't replicated in the training analysis. All the training analysis was using it at the patient level. So patients who are selectively given longer training, which is presumably because the nurses perceive them to need longer training, they, they don't get lower rates, but that's probably because of the patient population. So I've talked a bit about infection when you're trying to address transverse team analysis. But this is just demonstrating all the different causes that were considered in PDOFs as potential reasons why patients switch to hemodialysis. And you can see there's lots of them. Now, these are the ones that are grouped in the graphs I showed earlier. Um, but just to demonstrate, the far and away the biggest impact is coming from infection there. And that's the different specific causes grouped together in infection I've shown. But if we look at the specific causes, you can see that there's some clear standouts as other things that are causing significant numbers of transfers. So um, oops. you can see on the right that the ultrafiltration problems are the next commonest individual cause. And really that comes down to what Johan's just been talking about in terms of how do you manage ultrafiltration and that requires understanding of those principles that Johan's just been talking about because you then need to understand the different ways of managing the different problems that occur. If we look at the other one, the next common one, that's patient choice or burnout and that's this kind of psychosocial medical. Now to be quite honest I don't think we understand enough about that and why that happens and in particular what to do about that. So I think that's an area where we really do need to do more research to really try and figure out what we need to do to improve that. But it clearly is a significant issue. So there's not a lot we can really say about that from an evidence point of view, but clearly we need to recognise it in day-to-day -day clinical practice and we need to make sure the nurses are doing what they can to support the patients. And then the third most common one, inadequate clearance due to insufficient KTV or clearance. Now, that's a, a more interesting one. Um, so in terms of KTV and clearance, well, if we go back to the ISPD guidelines on what the role of clearance is 
So if we go to how to prescribe PD, which is where that's really covered, then we can see that the recommendation, the top recommendation is that PD should be prescribed using shared decision making and with the aim of achieving realistic care goals to maximize quality of life and satisfaction for the individuals, minimize their symptoms and provide high quality care. And nowhere does that say anything about small solute clearance measures. It does come up and that's in recommendation three. And that's saying that the KTV and creatinine clearance should be measured and that should factor in to the whole process about how you set priorities and decide what a patient really should have in terms of their PD and what changes they may benefit from. But nowhere does it say if your KTV is too low or any particular value, should you take any specific action? So actually, if we just go back to the graph, that bar should probably really be zero. There probably shouldn't really be any patients being switched due to an insufficient KTV or clearance. That it will need to be replaced with something and that will presumably be um, something to do with either symptoms or um, concerns about nutritional status or um, due to patient choice through a shared decision-making process of which clearances were one of the issues. But that as an individual category shouldn't really exist with our latest approach to prescribing PD. So what I've really tried to show you is that to increase time on PD, I think we need to make sure that patients both get onto PD in the first place, but we then need to reduce the negative outcomes for PD patients. So we need to try and make sure their transplant prospects are good, which will reduce time and PD, but we want to reduce transverse to hemodialysis, which will increase time and PD. There's substantial unwarranted variation in both those things, though. And that's both between countries, which is nas national policies, but it's also between centres, which is much more to do with what clinicians do and how units work on a day to day basis. So there's a clear need for improved recording and benchmarking, particularly for transfer to hemodialysis. And that needs to include causes because you can't really determine what the problems are when you have a high rate of transfer to hemodialysis unless you know the causes. Um, and we need to build this continuous improvement into routine day-to-day -day care. So we are recording and uh, assessing how our practice is doing and then making adjustments based on that. And then there's some specific things we need to do about increasing PD uptake, which is focused on overcoming barriers for all patients, um, strong leadership and champions for home dialysis, possibly quality improvement initiatives, offering assisted PD, and then there's some specific things around transverse team analysis. So that's regular multidisciplinary review, um, making peritonitis probably your top priority, but also considering the other problems based on your local audit and considering other things such as more APD for um, if you think the peritonitis rates may be a bit high. Um, and we can also recognize that there are some specific patient risk factors as well. So just going back to the question in the first place, the answer I would say is probably in terms of increasing time in PD, well, I didn't give you the option of increasing access to PD, but then after that, it probably is actually thinking about peritonitis, but as part of a continuous improvement approach. And I will finish there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for giving us such uh, interesting and insightful talk about um, the uh, longevity of PD and uh, how to keep people on PD. Um, with this, I would like to open this floor for discussions, and we have some questions coming through the chat box. And um, for the audience, please feel through, free to type your questions in the Q&A box. Now, I would like to start the first question to Johan, because I think, um, uh, you know, I mean, in nephrology now, we are all, I mean, the SGLT2 inhibitors are actually like one of the landmark drugs. So I just want to uh, raise this question to Johan and Mark as well. Um, about the use of SGLT2 in PD patients. Now, even though it is not um, an indicate, indicated uh, indications, however, I think there are like the GLUT1, 2, 3 expression in the peritoneal membrane, and this class of drug may potentially reduce the glucose absorption, and that might actually improve also ultrafiltration. So I want to um, have your thoughts and insights about potential role of this kind of drug in um, addressing the problem that Johan has mentioned in the first half of his talk. Uh, 
So thank you very much, uh, Angela, for the, the this interesting question. So um, two steps in my answer. First, SGLT2 inhibitors are potentially interesting in PD patients uh, to improve metabolic control, to preserve residual kidney function, and to reduce uh, cardiovascular events in such high-risk population exposed uh, to uh, high glucose loads. However, we, as, as you mentioned, we don't have the data, and, and so we cannot recommend uh, using SGLD2 inhibitors so far. Uh, there are some uh, investigations that are ongoing, and uh, but that, that's an interesting uh, approach. But this remains a uh, theory critical uh, at this uh, stage. Second part of my answer would be that, uh, indeed, we know that the GLUT, uh, glucose transporters, are expressed in the parietal membrane. And uh, nice works, uh, experimental works from Karl Oberg in Lund have shown that at least in an experimental model of PD, uh, blocking GLUT uh, molecules using uh, fluoretine may actually reduce the absorption of glucose and then enhance ultrafiltration. So these are very interesting results. They've been published uh, recently in the, the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology, and uh, more work is needed to uh, investigate this uh, interesting approach, of course, to enhance or to uh, preserve the uh, osmotic gradient and uh, ultrafiltration capacity. Yeah, I, mean, I think I'll probably add something to that as well. The, so in terms of the SGLT2 inhibitors, I think probably the biggest question actually is whether or not patients will benefit from the cardiovascular protection that the SGLT2 inhibitors appear to provide in the increases in, or decreases in mortality, increases in longevity. So that's a really important question. And there isn't any really good data that helps us answer that at the moment. What we need are large-scale RCT data on SGLT2 inhibitors and dialysis patients. I am only personally aware of one study that's currently ongoing on that, um, and that's based in the Netherlands, and that's that will hopefully give us some information on it, although I'm not sure it'll definitively answer that question because it's um, it's a combination. It's a slightly unusual study design where they're including CKD, transplant, and dialysis patients. Um, so it's how much we'll be able to infer dialysis patients specifically as a subgroup benefit will be, I think, will be slightly uncertain. Um, but that's really a very important question for dialysis generally. It's not just PD, and I think one that definitely needs answered. Um, I mean, it's I'd probably just add to the, the the study that Ewan was talking about. I think there are there's more than one way to interpret the results of that study. It does seem to benefit in terms of ultrafiltration, but there probably is more than one potential explanation of why it benefited. So that's slightly uncertain what, what the mechanism there was. Yes, yeah, very interesting, because I think there are also studies showing in EPS patients, um, the SGLD2 is upregulated um, you know, in the peritoneal membrane. Um, so whether that is relating to the pathological changes and whether use of this kind of drug may open up a treatment for EPS will be, you know, will need further research. So my next question, I think, is coming also from the floor. Um, it's about the uh, Aquaporin-1 um, gene variant that uh, Johan was talking about from the GWAS study. So I, I would like to know, like, how frequent is this uh, risk variant? Um, and also whether there are any difference between um, different ratio groups from your analysis. Yes, thank you very much. So the, the variant is actually a common variant, uh, and approximately, overall, 14% uh, of the patients in our cohort um, were homozygous for the risk variant, and the, the proportion of the patient or the prevalence of the variant was similar across the, the different cohorts in uh, European or Asian patients, and the, the prevalence of patients homozygous for the risk variant uh, ranged between 11 and 16% of the patients, if I remember well. And this uh, prevalence of the variant is very similar to the uh, general population. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thanks. And I think there's also one question from the audience, which you also have asked, but maybe you can uh, tell the group as well, like because um, uh, from the GWAS study, you have identified the variants and that uh, do you think it's feasible to, to generate this polygenic risk scores? To further improve the risk stratification, and I also would want to add the question whether, um, in fact, you think the this uh, risk variant is it already ready for the prime time that we actually adopt this uh, genetic testing 
um, in the clinical uh, arena uh, where we can do this testing in order to uh, do the precision dialysis prescription uh, using icodextrin, uh, you know, with this genetic information. So oh, yes, thank you. So for regarding the, the polygenic risk score, of, of course, is a very interesting approach and uh, it has been shown in many diseases to be very relevant to approach the, the risk or to uh, stratify the, 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 the risk in patients according to um, a series of different variants. And this has been shown also in the BioPD study in the original paper uh, regarding the associ association with uh, paternal solutions per rate. There are additional works uh, who are, which are ongoing uh, about uh, polygenic risk scores and water transport in the BioPD study. So uh, stay tuned for this. Um, and regarding the application of uh, the aquaporin-1 variant or screening for the aquaporin-1 variant in clinical practice, this is a very good question, of course. We have a tool to stratify the risk, um, how to impl implement this. It's it's a difficult question. I mean, the, the most important is probably to to look at the patient and to uh, make sure that there is no fluid overload and to address or to to restore fluid balance. Will there be a, a, an additional impact of identifying patients at risk uh, uh, carrying the, the the risk variant? We don't know. We need additional studies to to invest, investigate this question. Uh, on top of that, uh, another question that that pops up uh, when we think about this is that there is a an impressive increase in the risk of death uh, in patients carrying the, the risk variants. Is this only related to reduced ultrafiltration or are there additional pleiotropic effects? We know that the aquaporins are important in many um, uh, different uh, functions in the organisms, including immune function, function cardiovascular uh, system and so on. So we cannot rule, rule out so far uh, an impact on, on other systems than uh, peritoneal dialysis and uh, peritoneal ultrafiltration. That will be an important question to address in the future as well. It, it's probably worth just adding on the polygenic, oh, sorry, I was say, just worth adding on the polygenic risk scores. I mean, they're not really um, routine in clinical practice in pretty much any area, area that I'm aware of yet. And that's despite the fact that cancer and cardiovascular medicine have far, 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 far bigger data sets to generate genetic um, epidemiology and research. And it's almost certain that the, the first question that will need to be asked is, are polygenic risk scores of benefit anywhere? And that question is likely to come first from cardiovascular or, or oncology medicine and it, it will probably take a long time because the, the the amount of genetic material available in PD better than in hemodialysis, but it's still a tiny fraction of what is available in these other disease areas, and that does greatly limit our ability to sort of um, generate the methodological cutting edge research when it comes to genetic work. I mean, it gives us really really good insights into PD that we weren't available to do. But in terms of leading the genetic epidemiology methodology that's not really something that we're going to be able to deliver i don't think okay so um there are also a, a interesting question coming through from the chat uh, for both of you to address is are there any um, current available medications um that can actually preserve the membrane integrity better against the glucose toxicity um or any other novel solutions uh, would both of you like to address? Would you like to so, start, Mark? Um, yeah, ha happy to. So there certainly are novel solutions, but they're not proven yet. Um, there's an ongoing study of a stylosate solution that's replaced some of the glucose with another carbohydrate molecule called xylitol. Um, we need to get a, that study needs to be completed and reported on. Um, it won't be powered to really answer the questions we're going to want to ask of that question because it's being done for regulatory purposes, but it will at least give us some idea of whether glucose at the very high concentration is a driver of the membrane damage. There's also, um, there was a phase two study of a dialysate solution that had a preservative called alanine glutamine added to it. And again, that's not yet been able to get phase three funding. So that one's currently stuck at a slightly intermediate stage where we can't really answer the questions. The, the, the outcomes from that study were very much surrogate outcomes and um, not surrogate outcomes that could really justify the widespread use of that dialysate solution. So the, the answer to that question is we don't have novel dialysates at the moment. 
Um, there are a couple of prospects in the pipeline, but we don't know what the outcomes for that pipeline is going to be. Um, and again, there, there's you know there, there's a few small studies that are trying to make claims for other agents, but there's nothing yet that we, anybody can recommend as any kind of a treatment that should be adopted at any kind of a scale. Mm -hmm. So there's one uh, also one strategy uh, uh, previously, uh, you know, there there may have been literature suggesting about doing peritoneal rest for for a period of time. Um, so I want to have both your experiences to, you know, um, does that really work? You know, a, a short period of peritoneal rest uh, in, you know, in improving uh, peritoneal membrane function. What's your both experience? What's both your experience? We certainly looked at that in the Stoke data, Didn't ne never quite got around to getting it published, but um, there, there may be a slight improvement from peritoneal rest, but I, it's not a question we're going to get large amounts of data on um and the other thing to, to point out is that the way pd's been prescribed is certainly changing certainly within the uk and it fits with the new ispd guidelines which are basically providing free range for people to use an incremental dialysis and if your incremental regime involves one or two or even three days a week off pd then effectively you're building a peritoneal rest into your dialysate regime. Even having a dry day is to some extent building a rest into your dial your daily dialysis regime. So I suspect it's more likely we'll get data from that sort of peritoneal rest rather than peritoneal rest of take the patient off PD for a few months and see what happens, because that's always going to be a bit niche and patients aren't really going to want to do that j just in case it provides benefits. So we'll, we'll probably not be able to answer that question, but we'll probably be able to address it a different way once we've got some databases that have got that sort of routine data collected. Okay, great. Um, and also, I think there is uh, one question coming through which is more practical about doing PET tests, you know, because in uh, resource-restricted countries, we don't do, uh, I mean, the PET test is really consuming a lot of um, uh, resources and manpower. Um, so I would like to ask both your uh, advice as to whether you think we need to do a regular PET test. Um, everyone uh, starting PD should have a baseline PET test and when do we have to repeat it? Uh, and what solution do you use? And if patients, if the center doesn't have people working in the morning, so how can they modify, any way to modify the PET test? Okay, I can, I can take it. So that's a very, very important question because uh, we acknowledge that uh, performing the PET are, uh, is, is time consuming and uh, resource consuming. So uh, it's, it can be very challenging even uh, here in our uh, unit. So it's not easy to perform those tests uh, regularly. Uh, that being said, it's a useful tool to quantify uh, membrane characteristics and uh, it has been shown to be a, a very good predictor of outcomes. So there is value. But we must acknowledge that's very important. First, that there is no um, robust evidence. There is no prospective randomized control trial, trial demonstrating that performing the PET and adapting the prescription to the results uh, improves the outcome. So that's, that's very important to keep in mind. We don't have this evidence so far. And on top of that, when the PET is not feasible for uh, because of, of limited uh, resources, uh, we can observe what, what happens uh, in, in patients. In most of our patients, when we start PD, patients are started on CAPD for a couple of weeks just to under understand the technique before switch, switching if they want to APD. And so we can observe the, the, the clinical response actually and modulating the duration of glucose-based dwells can uh, provide some information about the membrane characteristics. For instance, um, as it has been stated or suggested um, based on the on the clinical observation, having a negative ultrafiltration uh, after a, a, a dwell of less than three hours may suggest fast pattern solution for rate, while sustained ultrafiltration after a dwell lasting more than or at least four hours um, suggests non-fast transport status. And so we can adapt prescription based on the clinical response. I think this is still valuable, even if we don't have access to the PET. And we, we must keep in mind that there is no robust evidence to, to, to support systematic peritoneal membrane testing every six or 12 months so far, even though there is a rational to, 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 to think that it can, uh, it can help monitoring membrane integrity and very nice work by Mark and others have shown that uh, there are some uh, modifications in membrane transport before, for instance, 
Peritoneal uh, equilibrium, um, uh, encapsulating peritoneal uh, sclerosis occurs, and so that, that's quite interesting. This is a proof of concept, but still, uh, these are uh, short observational uh, studies. Could I ask, are there any uh, biomarkers that can actually predict, um, you know, you know, the peritoneal membrane dysfunction over time? Um, you know, like say if you have proteinuria. Um, that can predict people go on to kidney failure. So do we have a similar marker, um, biomarker in the peritoneum uh, or the dialysate that can predict long-term peritoneal uh, dysfunction, membrane dysfunction? We we don't have a biomarker that would be um, useful for clinical practice. Um, there, I mean, probably the best, I mean, it depends what you view as a biomarker. I mean, I'd say the best, data we've got really comes from Johan's study, which is the D, the D over um, P sodium or the sodium dipping. Um, and that that is in effect a biomarker. And that is the thing that seems to be best able to predict that progressive deterioration or it, as, even it, to some extent it's identifying it. It's identifying that progressive fibrosis. Um, but that progressive fibrosis is also therefore going to be predictive of future fibrosis. Um, there is, I mean, there are some biomarkers that are associated with the membrane damage. The best validated is probably IL-6. Um, but even so, that's not really, um, doesn't really stand up in terms of a clinical biomarker. It's only ever been used in the research thing. And almost certainly it would fail the tests you would want of any biomarker in terms of um, positive predictive value and any of the other uh, ways that a biomarker could be, could come unstuck. Right. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mark. And um, I think there is a question from the floor asking about pediatrics, which I want to quickly address. That is, um, what kind of considerations you need to take when you do a PET test on pediatric patients? I'll let you take that one. <laughs> No, I, I'm very sorry, but uh, as I'm not a, a pediatric nephrologist, it's very difficult for me to answer that question. I'm not really aware of the specificities in children. I know that the volume instilled for the pet is is adapted to uh, the body surface area of the of, of the, the, the children. But this is a very important question, and I I, I cannot answer it very uh, confidently. So I, I think it's very it's, it would be better to ask a, a pediatric nephrologist to, to to discuss this this question. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. We all are at our nephrologists. <laughs> but thanks to the pediatric nephrologists for joining this session, you know. Um, I just want to ask a question as well, because we've been talking about ultrafiltration and water transport. But what about the sodium? Like, um, how best can we assess sodium removal in peritoneal dialysis? As we know, the volume overload is clearly a component of both water and sodium. So, um, would, would you both be able to shed some insight as to how best we can um, assess this removal or anything, you know? Um, I, I can start if you, if you wish. No, uh, that's, that's also important in clinical practice, actually, to remove sodium. And we know that... Uh, Removing sodium during PD takes time. We need, we 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 must avoid short duration dwells. You know, like uh, less than uh, ninety minutes is probably too short to to remove sodium. So that's very important, even in patients with fast transport status. That being said, it's difficult to measure uh, sodium re removal, or actually, it's difficult to interpret it because um, the amount of sodium that will be removed uh, across the parietal membrane and that will be found also in the urine will also reflect the amount of sodium ingested. And so there have, there have been studies notably by ATES some years ago, which show uh, an association between uh, sodium removal during PD and survival. But we know since then that actually this also this also reflects actually the, the, the dietary habits or the dietary intake. And we must be very careful when interpreting these, uh, these data. I don't know what's Mark's opinion on this. I, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I'd probably add in that I, th I suspect you, you do actually have a very good guide to the sodium removal in that it co correlates very, very closely with your total ultrafiltration volumes. So um, that's going to be your best guide to how much sodium you're removing. There, there can be differences depending on exactly how PD is prescribed that may make some small differences particularly with, say, rapid um, exchanges in APD, that you may be getting slightly more in the way of your sodium dipping and therefore a little bit less 
proportionately to your ultrafiltration, but those changes are really pretty minor. Um, and I don't think anybody's ever demonstrated that those really quite minor differences between the sodium removal and the water removal actually translates to a meaningful difference for how you would manage the patient clinically. Yeah, that's truly important. Yeah, I think both of you have addressed many important questions. Perhaps we come to the last question because we are approaching 1020. Um, and this relate to Mark's talk. I think it's very interesting to see how important the unit culture, you know, may actually um, be related to the rate of transfer um, to uh, hemodialysis. So I, I would like both of you to shed some light. So how can we, you know, given the importance of the unit culture and the, and, and, and how can we actually, um, what we can do to promote a um, positive unit culture to promote, you know, home dialysis and also to minimize rate of transfer to hemodialysis among the other uh, in, important factors like uh, minimize peritonitis, et cetera, you know. I mean, I think it's a really important question. I mean, we know that this unwarranted variation is occurs in all healthcare systems and then across all disease specialities and pretty much all outcomes that we measure. So it's clearly a universal phenomenon and we don't yet really fully understand exactly what drives it. But certainly when it comes to access to hemodialysis, we know that culture is, we now know that culture is a big bit of the, the, the issue. Um, unfortunately, all the studies that have been done so far in healthcare in terms of trying to change culture show that changing culture is incredibly difficult and mostly unsuccessful. So it, it's it's a really important question, but it's also an incredibly difficult problem to solve. I mean, I think part of it is probably just actually going to be acknowledging that the unit culture may play as big a role in determining patient outcome as individual clinicians. I mean, individual clinicians are, it's important what individual clinicians do but they're always working as part of a team. It's never actually just all about one single individual healthcare professional and how that team works together has at least as big an impact on the outcomes for those patients as the individual does. And we probably just need to recognise the importance of that and recognise the importance of culture as a start. Um, and I'm sure there will be many more studies in the future about how you go about changing culture in the, within any sort of unit of healthcare but we don't yet have the answers to that. I mean, I think partly it's also just starting to think about this ongoing continuous improvement approach, because that was definitely one of the themes that comes through is that's how you go about improving peritonitis, as happened in Australia. That's how you go about improving it in, in units that where they've targeted a high home dialysis uptake. We don't have good examples yet for impacting directly on transfer to hemodialysis, but almost certainly that same approach is going to be required, that of continuous benchmarking, recording of your data, ongoing audit, and a continuous improvement approach. Mm -hmm. So in your literature review uh, of other studies, what is the usual or the average transfer rate from uh, PD to hemo? Or is there a vulnerable period um, of which there is the highest transfer like in most of these cohorts? Um, the the rate them. of it doesn't vary over time that much. It's fairly constant. Um, I mean, probably the highest risk is going to be early on in the first few months because you've got the additional problems of the catheter problems and leak problems occurring then, and they then become they then diminish with time. But probably the, the risk, that's only a small proportion of your causes. So it's probably not making a big difference to your overall risk. So it's probably a fairly constant risk. I mean, most of it is going to be due to peritonitis, which is fundamentally a stochastic and, and therefore a somewhat unpredictable event that can occur at any time. Um, and therefore that sort of sets your baseline rates to be fairly constant over time. So there's probably not really a specific window, but you probably do need to think about it more in terms of the specific causes and you probably need to be targeting the early fit time period on making sure that you're um, managing your catheters well at the early phase and then thinking more long term about the peritonitis always needs to be a priority. And then in the longer term, you need to think more about the issues that Johan was identifying with membrane function and fluid management and thinking a bit about the amount of support your patients are getting in terms of that sort of 
burnout and patient choice for switching when they're getting just a bit burnt out with the, the self-care problems. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Johan? No, I think it's a very complete uh, answer from Mark, and uh, I totally agree with what has been said. So, no, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, thank you to both of you, uh, Johan and Mark, for giving us such um, excellent lectures and also very insightful um, answers to all these uh, discussion questions. And I'm sure everyone would agree that uh, we have a great session today. And I would also like to thank ISN and ISPD for um, jointly collaborate in this webinar session. And also thank you to all the audience for um, staying till now after one and a half hour. And with this, I would like to give this uh, webinar a close. And the webinar is recorded and the uh, recordings will be available from both the ISPD and the ISN Web Academy website. So thank you everyone and have a nice day. Thank you, Angela. Thank you everyone for joining. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.